much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you. You, you make me feel like Celine Dion. <laughs> My, my friends in show business say, you're going around to beautiful theaters like this, giving lectures at universities and museums, you who got thrown out of every school you ever went to? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, whenever I get a speaking invitation, I ask myself the question, would the great English theatrical couple, the Lunts, accept? If I feel they would, then I'm your man. I'm on an airplane and I'm here. I recently read a biography of the Lunds where the author speculated that this great pair had by the end of their career exhausted the concept of fame itself, something that is quite appealing to me. <laughs> I, I tell my friends, this is not a lecture, this is vaudeville, and I, I'm looking for an opening act. Yes. If, if you know anybody, like an especially hideous child contortionist, or, <laughs> or, or better yet, somebody that can juggle nude with a heart on, send them, send them the resume to me. In Baltimore, care of Atomic Books, where I get special mail. Vaudeville's been very important to me. When I was a kid, Divine and I used to hook school and go downtown to the Gaiety Burlesque, and they let anybody in. It was the last stages of vaudeville. They had, like, baggy pants comedians and strippers with great names like Kim DeMilo and Irma the Body. And our favorite was one named Zorro. Zorro was really butch. She looked like Johnny Cash. <laughs> and she just came out nude. She didn't strip. <laughs> And she looked at the men in the audience and said, what the fuck are you looking at? <laughs> and, and they loved her. You know, we, we love Zorro. I'm here today because of Zorro's example, really. I mean, maybe as a teenager, I, I wanted to be Visconti. But as I realize I get older, my career is becoming more and more of out of Paul Lynn's. <laughs> uh, what, what I really wanted to do tonight was come out and do my entire Broadway musical Hairspray for you, all two and a half hours, sing every song in Pig Latin, as I made exact eye contact with every person in this audience until you're squirming in your seats, ready to rush home and watch the best s and movie for the whole family, Mel Gibson's The Passion, and you've seen it a million times, you can wear the outfits and scream out the dialogue like you would in the Rocky Horror Picture Show. But. Since I'm more of a life-affirming guy these days, I, I guess I'll start with my early artistic negative influences. All young people need somebody bad to look up to, and I hope I can be that for you tonight. <laughs> sort of a filth elder, if you will. When I was a child, the Holy Trinity to me was the Wicked Witch of the West, uh, Rhoda Penmark, the child murderess in The Bad Seed, and Captain Hook. Uh, I prayed to these people. Uh, the Wicked Witch, I was in drag only once in my life, and that was as the Wicked Witch, and I went to a children's birthday party. And uh, it wasn't so much, you know, I raised a few parents' eyebrows, but it wasn't so much that I wanted to wear a dress, although that is a beautiful come de garçon number she wears in that, <laughs> because, because I wanted to have green skin, something you can see is coming true. Uh, I, I was the only kid in the audience that didn't understand why Dorothy would ever want to go home. It was a mystery to me. <laughs> to that awful black and white farm with that aunt who was dressed badly with smelly farm animals around. <laughs> when, when she could live with winged monkeys and magic shoes and gay lions. I didn't get it. <laughs> when, Dorothy would be clicking her heels together, I'd be the only child in the audience sobbing uncontrollably. <laughs> Now, I pretended I was Rhoda Penmark for a long time, but I didn't tell anyone. I, I watched The Bad Seed over and over, and, and I would uh, go to school, and, and my, uh, the teacher would say, so, hi, Johnny, did you do your homework? And I'd say yes, but in my mind, I was thinking, give me those shoes, <laughs> which is my favorite line that Rhoda Penmark says in the movie. And I'd repeat that line over and over like a mantra, and it would, it would get me into a frenzy of childhood obsession that made me such a happy child, actually. <laughs> I was doing this act once at a horror convention, and in the question and answer period, a middle-aged woman said, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about The Bad Seed? And I was telling about the great ad campaign, The Big Shocker, and how it was on Broadway. And finally she said, because I am Patty McCormick. And it was like, whoa! And she came up on stage and we embraced, and it was great. It was like being on John Waters' This Is Your Life. <laughs> 
Now, the only male figure I had to really look up to was Captain Hook, but uh, the Captain Hook of my childhood was the one in the Mary Martin version on television, and Cyril Richard played Captain Hook, who, I look at it now, he's the biggest queen I've ever seen in my life. You know, I guess I didn't realize that as a child, but uh, I, my parents allowed me to wear a coat hanger up my sleeve for about a year. I just couldn't wear it at the dinner table. That was the one rule. But I went further. I wanted to have long hair like Captain Hook, and so I didn't have wigs or anything. So I would just take my father's ties and scotch tape them to my head. <laughs> but it didn't work very well. I had to have like mounds of scotch tape to keep them on. I'd turn my head once and they'd fall off, so I'd put more tape. And so I'd have 30 rolls of tape. And we had a cleaning lady once named Clara, and she discovered me with all the ties scotch taped to my head, and she ran from the house and quit. <laughs> And I just thought, well, good, she walked the plank. I just felt more like Captain Hook. <laughs> now, the first director that interested me was somebody named William Castle. Uh, I knew about William Castle because I read about him in Life magazine, that he came to the premiere of his movie in a hearse and jumped out of a coffin. I thought, <laughs> well, you know, I would do that today. Would Godard? I doubt it. Uh, but, but when you saw Macabre, you had, when you bought a ticket, you had to fill out a form, a life insurance policy, in case you die of fright. So as a kid, I thought that meant that someone was going to die at every performance. <laughs> so I would be sitting there thinking, who will it be, looking around at the audience. Uh, William Castle was king of the gimmicks. Every, every one of his movies, he had a gimmick. And so I went to see The House on Haunted Hill. And, and in that, he had a skeleton that in the middle of the movie came from a wire behind the screen over the audience to the projection booth. It was childhood bedlam. The whole theater went insane throwing popcorn boxes. And I, I tried to emulate this great moment in every movie I ever made. I got close with the eating shit scene at the end of Pink Flamingos, but even that didn't cause the frenzy that this caused. Uh, his next movie was The Tingler, and that's my personal favorite. Um, in that one, the tingler is an organism that grows in your body and gets larger and larger when you're frightened, and the only way you can kill it is to scream. Well, <laughs> naturally, there's a mute in the film, and... Uh, <laughs> The mute is in the theater and the tingler gets loose and you hear the announcer in the movie say, ladies and gentlemen, the tingler is loose in the theater. Scream, scream for your life. And everybody starts screaming and then Percepto, these little electric buzzers went off under the seat and gave you a little electric shock. <laughs> it was so good. You know, it, when it finally came to the theater in my neighborhood, they only bothered to wire about two or three of the seats. So I'd go early and look under every seat till I found the Percepto buzzer and then just sit there and get my ass buzzed all day long. <laughs> two, four, six, eight, and 10 o'clock show. And that's when I realized that there could be such a thing as art in the cinema. Then I got serious when the nuns told us about another director, not nearly as famous. His name was Kroger Babb, and to this day, he's not very celebrated. The nuns said, if you see this film, Mom and Dad, you will go to hell. And I thought, <laughs> Mom and Dad? What's so bad about that? It sounds like a normal movie. So I looked in the newspapers and figured out that Mom and Dad played for seven years in Baltimore. It was such a hit. So I started cutting out the ads for Mom and Dad and made scrapbooks and <laughs> pretended I owned a dirty movie theater and I imagined the horror it would cause in my parents' community. And when I finally saw Mom and Dad, the key to its success was they showed the actual birth of a baby, a medical film. And that was the only way in the late 50s that you could see frontal female nudity. So I guess the dirty old men just ignored the baby and looked at the <laughs> vagina. So it was birth as a masturbation aid that was very, very odd. And Kroger Babb went on almost to invent four-walling, which is when you just rent a theater or a, a public space and you provide the film and you get all the money. He, he specialized in towns that had no movie theaters. He would rent bingo halls and fire stations and rotary clubs. And he'd arrive a week early with a car with a loudspeaker on the top that would go up and down the main street saying, coming this weekend, mom and dad, segregated shows, men only in the evening and women in the afternoon. And he had fake nurses that walked up and down the aisle selling fake sex education literature. And, uh, and in some towns, when he was really feeling nervy, he would put nauseous gas in the vents so people would pass out in the theater. So in the paper the next day, they would have shocked patron taken from mom and dad. <laughs> I thought of doing that tonight, actually. It was, 
it would be a good cutaway shot, wouldn't it, to see one of y'all going out on a stretcher in the back or something? <laughs> Kroger had a niche audience. You know, he went further. He, he later made a movie that was only showed at AA meetings called One Too Many. <laughs> he, he toured cancer clinics, I'm not making this up, with a film called The Best Is Yet To Come. <laughs> and in his final film, To Get Back at the Catholic Church, who was always hassling him, he made a, a movie called Father Bingo, which is a great title. <laughs> now, how do we use this great example of showmanship of William Castle and Kroger Bab to, to, today? Uh, you know, if, if you want to start a college film series, um, they used to have them when I was growing up, and they were great. They showed controversial films. Now they show Star Wars. You know, it's not the same. Um, they don't even show foreign films anymore. I hate it when people say, I hate subtitles. I love them. Even white subtitles in snow movies I like. <laughs> so, if, if you want to start a film society, you have to think of ways to get people to come. So basically, the first rule is let people in free and make them pay to get out. It's an old <laughs> trick. Drive-ins always used to do it. You make all the money in the concession stand. It really works. Um, if you're showing a movie that's promising a little more sexuality than it delivers, have the ushers be nude one night. Just don't say anything, but when people show up, and just deny it to your school staff. That isn't true. Of course they weren't <laughs> nude. It's too late. You can get away with the lie, and word will spread that things happen at your film society. <laughs> Show porn. You know, porn and art today are, are really close. Um, you know, I curated a show at the Warhol Museum called Andy's Porn, and they let me look through Andy's real pornography, his personal porn, his wax stack. And, and we showed that alongside of, of Andy's movies that he made at the time that were fairly pornographic, and you really couldn't tell the difference because Andy's porn was 70s, which meant kind of mullets and hard-ons, which looks like art today. It looked like Larry Clark's work. You really couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> And, and today, kids are jerking off to Sotheby's catalogs. I mean, if you look through them, there's like Jeff Koons and Chicholina fucking in there. So it's, it's really a thing you can get away with. And if, if you want to go even further, put little masturbation booths in the theater, you know, and have architects compete for the design of each one. Put little windshield wipers on. Actually, it could work. Really, it, it really will get the word out there. Now, as a kid, the library saved my life. I mean, most everybody here likes the library. Many of you probably had your first sexual experience at the library. <laughs> I don't know, when I was young, book reports and glory holes, they just went hand in hand. <laughs> We have to make books cool again, you know? If you go home with somebody and they don't have books, don't fuck them. <laughs> and, <laughs> and DVDs don't count either. I, I had a plumber that came in my house and he looked around and he said, ugh, do you read all these books? I hate reading. Turning those pages, right to left, right to left, right to left. <laughs> oh God, you know. I, I, I respected his militancy, you know, but you know, even as a kid, you know, I would go to the library and look in the card catalog and I'd look up things I wanted to read, like the Wolfenden Report or uh, A Hat Full of Rain or uh, Freud's Three Case Histories, and it would say, Sea Librarian. And uh, that pissed me off. And, and so I found out where the Sea Librarian books were behind the counter and I stole them while they were talking to the regular children. So that just goes. <laughs> to show that if you're a librarian today and a kid asks for naked lunch and he's seven years old, if he's heard of it, in my book, he's old enough to read it. <laughs> so we, I think we have to inspire people. So I really think that gay men and women, you should make a New Year's resolution this year to only blow teachers. Wouldn't that be nice, really? And then teachers will be freshly blown and satisfied and they will try harder to really interest our students and our young people today. <laughs> Because we know that, you know, a boredom leads to anger and then the children will kill us. So basically, <laughs> it's a good idea. If you're a teacher, you have to keep kids interested. If you're teaching a boring literature course and they don't want to read these novels, have them translated into Ebonics. They'll pay attention. <laughs> if they're not doing their spelling lessons, throw in a word like analingus. <laughs> They'll perk up. If, if you have a kid that's on drugs, pretend you're on drugs, too. <laughs> hey, man, what you doing, homie? You do your homework? You know, and they'll be so mortified, maybe they'll stop doing it. Um, you have to be ahead of the curve. It's not good enough to say to a kid you might think is gay, it's all right to be gay. They know it's all right. You gotta tell them you don't have to like Liza Minnelli. <laughs> you, you gotta tell them S&M does look stupid at the beach. <laughs> um, you know, 
had your crotch. Wear falsies. That's not illegal. You got to keep them interested. Um, there's a book for every kid. If, if you have a kid that's too violent, there's a book called The Shoemaker about this terrible killer in Philadelphia. And what he would do is he'd go kill children and then come home and go down in his basement and take out hamsters and force them to wear high heels while he jerked off. <laughs> well, give this to the kid, you know? He, he won't go out, maybe. Or if, if you have a daughter that you think is being too promiscuous too early, tell her about womb raiders. This is a new thing that's going on. These women that tell their husbands they're pregnant, but they're not, so when they're nine months, they have to go find a baby, and they follow pregnant women in the mall, and they cut out their baby and take it home and say, I had it. Um, you know, there's a great book called Lullaby and Good Night, and this woman cut it out with a car key. This poor woman, talk about a bad day at the mall. You know, and tell your daughter this, if you get pregnant, someone's gonna follow you in the mall and cut your baby out with a car key, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> you, you have to remember, there, you can't commit a crime while reading a book. That's really important to know with children. Underground movies saved my life, too. When I was a kid, they had just come out, and when I was young, art meant dirty, and that's the way it should stay, I think. Um, you can't, we had great critics like Jonas Mikas who, who would name projectionists that maybe showed one reel out of focus and expect the readers to take retribution personally out on him. Uh, also, you got arrested when you went to the movies. Can you imagine how exciting that was? You'd go see flaming creatures and the cops would raid it and the whole audience would be taken away in police vans. I mean, it really perks up the movie-going experience. <laughs> I, my heroes as a kid were the Kuchar brothers, George and Mike Kuchar, and they started making eight millimeter uh, melodramas in their mom's Bronx apartment using thrift shop costumes and basically stolen soundtracks from Hollywood movies and great titles like Pussy on a Hot Tin Roof and <laughs> Hold Me While I'm Naked, Sins of the Fleshapods. And they're still making these movies today. And uh, they've inspired young kids for four generations really to make great movies. And I really think they should get the MacArthur Award. Um, for real, I do. Um, I also like Kenneth Anger very much. He was really the first person that ever did the ironic use of pop music. Everybody copied him, Scorsese, me, everybody copied him. He did it first. And of course, Warhol, who had the great idea to finally put homosexuality and drugs together at last on the screen. <laughs> So I tried to, I lived in Lutherville, Maryland, and I tried to make underground movies. It was hard being depraved in Lutherville, I'll tell you. But uh, I made the first one, it was an eight millimeter movie called Hag in a Black Leather Jacket. And it was, it was about a Ku Klux Klan guy who married a white woman and a black man on the roof of my parents' house. Um, it was shown once to no notice in a beatnik coffee house. Uh, I didn't even know there was editing then, so uh, I thought what came out of the camera was the movie, and in this case, it was. Um, I didn't realize it was Dogma 95, way ahead of its time, actually. <laughs> Next came Roman Candles, which was uh, very much influenced by the Chelsea Girls, which was, of course, the Warhol film with two films showing side by side. So I did three movies side by side. And it was basically just home movies of my friends like Mink Stoll shoplifting and wearing outfits they had stolen from the paraphernalia boutique in New York. Um, we were really good shoplifters. Um, I, I had a special <laughs> coat for records. And uh, I don't feel bad because those same records I pay 25000 each today to put as soundtracks in my movie. So they got the money back. It just took 40 years. <laughs> Once, uh, in Corvette's department store, I was stealing records, and I saw the store detective see me, so I put them back, and she didn't see me put them back, and I got outside and was arrested, and I sued and got $3,000. <laughs> I remember my parents were so furious that summer. They said, well, you're going to get a summer job? And I said, I want a lawsuit. I don't need to work. And they were like, oh, God. Um, Divine was really good. I saw Divine walk out of a department store once holding a chainsaw and a TV, just... <laughs> no one said one word, actually. <laughs> now, shoplifting is kind of passe today. What's in the kids do now is dropping. Now, dropping is not to be confused with mopping. Mopping is when drag queens smash the window of Bergdorf and steal a Valentino dress and run. Um, <laughs> Dropping is when you go to a thrift shop and you find the most disgusting stained outfit and you buy it and then you take it and sneak it in Gucci's window and put it on a hanger in the mannequin and take a picture of it and run. It's kind of nice, I think, because it's shoplifting in reverse. It's like, is it illegal even? I'm not sure. It's kind of like making a donation in a way. Um, you know, I'm the, I'm the only 
really a director that wishes somebody would colorize his early movies. Um, I, I think Mondo Trash or Multiple Maniacs in kind of a puke green would add a certain cachet to that. When, when we were young, you know, I, I didn't even know what we were doing when we were making those movies. I mean, we made one called Eat Your Makeup. And in that movie, uh, it was about a deranged governess and her lover who kidnapped fashion models and forced them to eat their makeup and model themselves <laughs> to death. It sounds a lot better than it is. Uh, <laughs> there's one good scene where, where Divine plays Jackie Kennedy and we have the full Kennedy assassination where Divine crawls over the trunk of the car and the bloody Chanel you know, pillbox hat and suit. And, but people really didn't think it was funny because it was two years after it happened. <laughs> I was still living at home at the time and my mother said, what are you shooting today? Oh, nothing, nothing, you know. <laughs> And then the neighbors would come out and go, oh my God, when they would see it. And Divine's mother found his bloody Jackie Kennedy outfit wadded up in the trunk of her car. And she didn't even know he was Divine or we made movies or anything. And she said, what the hell is this? And he was so nervous, he just said, I am Jackie Kennedy. <laughs> um, we liked Jackie Kennedy. I mean, it wasn't anything against her. I felt bad, you know, when, when Eat Your Makeup was finally shown at the New Museum show and, and uh, had never been shown in New York. And the New York Times, when they reviewed it, ran a half-page picture this year of Divine as Jackie and the Kennedy assassination. I thought, oh, poor Caroline. She doesn't know about that movie. She reads the New York Times every day. She turns the page and, oh, my God, now this she has to deal with. Um, I tried to buy Jacqueline Kennedy's trash can from Sotheby's when they had the big auction. I, I really wanted to own it, and it wasn't in the first auction. That was her fine furniture. But when they had part two, it was a little bit more <laughs> of her thrift shop stuff. So I, I kept calling Sotheby's, and they wouldn't call me back. And finally, she called back, and I said, she must have had a trash can. And the woman said to me, you saw the catalog. She didn't throw anything out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Melanie Griffith told me the best Jacqueline Kennedy story, that when people asked for her autograph, she just said, you'll understand. Which meant, no, you cretin, how could you even think of asking? But people just went, oh, okay. And uh, Jodie Foster has a good one, too. I've heard her say, like, uh, they won't let me. And people go, oh, well, who's they? You know, the, the autograph police? Uh, we didn't know what we were doing. When, when I made Mondo Trasho, I didn't know there was such a thing as like a location manager. There, there's a scene in it where Divine crawls through pig shit and the virgin mother appears to him. So we just drove around one Sunday morning until we found a farm that had pigs. I said, okay, get out, you know, and <laughs> Divine started crawling in the pig shit and the pigs started fucking. And do you know how much I'd have to pay an animal wrangler today to do that? <laughs> That's how he got the nickname the Hog Princess, really, because uh, he made the pigs horny, actually. And, and it was a sleeting cold day, and I could see the farmers were home. There was, like, smoke coming out of their chimney and everything, and I thought, well, what did they think? The farm wife saying, look, honey, there's some hippies, and there's a drag queen in the pig pen. They're making a movie. But I don't know what they said, because we were there eight hours, and they never came out of their house. <laughs> They were frozen inside saying, probably thinking there's people on LSD that are gonna kill us. <laughs> we, um, we got arrested making that movie too for conspiracy to commit indecent exposure. There's a later scene where Divine is uh, driving a red 1959 red Cadillac Eldorado convertible with the top down where she imagines a uh, hitchhiker nude and Divine is dressed also in a gold lame Toreador outfit. And uh, once again, I didn't ask permission. We just went to Hopkins University that was near where I lived. I thought, oh, they'll be liberal, they won't care. Well, some guard saw us and thought we were making a porn movie and called the police. So right in the middle of the shoot, there was a raid on the set, cops coming from every direction. Everybody ran in different directions. And the odd thing was, we all got arrested and Divine got away. And <laughs> you think of it, Divine was driving a 59 Cadillac Eldorado with a top down and a gold lame Toyota outfit with a nude man next to him. And he got a way that, that that really doesn't say a lot for the Baltimore police I think people see those early movies and say you all must have been on drugs when you made them well we were <laughs> um, I don't take drugs today because they're so retro I think um, well I did smoke crack accidentally this year but I, I thought it was pot and I took a drag and I, oh I felt like Whitney Houston uh, 
But the drugs you all take, I mean, ecstasy, a drug that makes you love everyone? That sounds like hell to me. <laughs> and I don't have the outfits for a K-hole, really. And, and, and crystal meth, I mean, I read these stories about how in the gay community, people get so addicted and this started a new part of kind of AIDS that started from this one guy that said he had had over a thousand unprotected passive anal sex this year and it was only March. <laughs> you know, I'm afraid to take cold medicine. Um, I tell you, I, the only drug I take is, is one drug I really like and this is the one I believe in, poppers. <laughs> uh, sometimes in the day if it's boring, I just go upstairs, take a hit and spin around on my office chair and woo! <laughs> Perks up a day, you know? Uh, when I was young, I used to go to Coney Island and do big hits of it going up the roller coaster, and then when you go down, wow, wow, wow. I had a friend in the old days that was addicted to poppers, too, and she used to just hang in the laundromat all day in a sheer outfit, like doing poppers and cruising guys that came in high. <laughs> I, I have a popper problem, you know. I, I've been popper free for a long time, but I went in a sex store and, and I saw these, so I, I'm, I'm gonna give them to you all so you can keep me popper free, yeah. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, I think actually the, probably the worst taste thing I ever did was a movie called The Diane Linkletter Story. Many of you are too young to remember, but Diane Linkletter had a father, Art Linkletter, who's still alive, and he was friends of Nixon and Billy Graham, very kind of right-wing kind of guy. And uh, supposedly his daughter took LSD and committed suicide while she was on LSD. It was a big thing in the news. All your parents said, see, this is what happens when you take LSD. So we read about it in the paper that morning and made a movie of it that day, and Divine played Diane. <laughs> and, I felt guilty because we had the movie in a theater before the funeral. And, uh, <laughs> but I don't feel so guilty today because recently, you know, the Nixon Watergate tapes are still being released. And in one of them recently, I read the transcripts and it was about how Nixon and um, Art Linkletter knew that his daughter really had not taken acid for a year before she killed herself, but they never let that out because they wanted to blame Leary and be an anti-drug statement. So I'm really glad I did it. And, and it, Art Linkletter did something even in worse taste. He put out a record called, We Love You, Call Collect, after she killed herself. You know, that's worse than the movie, I think, you know. <laughs> but I love the idea of an instant movie where you, it's a perfect exercise for film students. Uh, read the paper that morning, make a movie of it that day, and imagine people surprised driving home from work when they see on a marquee a title reflecting something that only entered their consciousness that very morning. Um, <laughs> The Diane Linkletter went on to uh, sort of influence the Coquettes, the San Francisco bearded group, made a movie called Trisha's Wedding afterwards. And this was when Trisha Nixon got married. They premiered the movie the exact same moment as her real wedding with all drag queens playing like Pat Nixon and Martha Mitchell and stuff. <laughs> And it goes on today. I mean, isn't Charlize Theron as Eileen Warnos the same thing in a way? Um, why didn't she thank Eileen when she won the Oscar? I, I didn't think that was fair. Without Eileen's great hairdos and fashion rage, she would have never been on that stage clutching that statue. Um, there's great stories every day that would make great instant movies. Um, Sue Africa, the only white girl in the Back to Nature move group in Philadelphia they dropped a bomb on. I love her. Or Uncle Ed, another great Philadelphia story. Uh, an old guy that paid every straight teenager for 10 years beer, for beer money. He'd get their dirty underpants and keep them. And every straight guy knew, and they never told until they found this big warehouse of dirty underpants and busted poor Uncle Ed. <laughs> or, the 9-11 nympho, as the New York Post called her. This woman that after 9-11 supposedly went and fucked entire police stations, fire departments, and her husband said, I don't know why. She, she doesn't know anyone that died and she didn't see it happen. Um, <laughs> uh, or, you know, the Bush daughters. I mean, these are roles drag queens are born to play, you know? And, <laughs> yeah, that, that great New York Post headline about them, Jenna and Tonic, that was a great one, you know. <laughs> and Michael Jackson. God, you know, everybody's not thinking about him anymore. I'm still obsessed by him, you know. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I remember when the E! Network had the reenactments of his trial every night at 7 o'clock. I didn't watch, but I looked over at the TV at 7 and was so happy knowing it was inside there. <laughs> and... I, <laughs> 
I don't know if he's guilty or not. I have no idea. But, but basically, it seemed like right before the verdict, every newscaster really wanted him to be guilty. They said, he will be taken to a special unit that for the most notorious criminals in California. He will be with Manson, the Unabomber, Juan Corona. I thought, this is a great movie. It's The Breakfast Club, basically. <laughs> And I'm trying to picture, you know, you know, Michael Jackson in jail out of drag, you know, without, he's 48 without that makeup and the wig. Who knows what he looks like, you know, and, and, and saying to Manson, oh, Charlie, make Blanket one of those little sock dolls, please. You know. So I think the reason that really Michael couldn't be convicted, and I still bet he's having a hard time getting a play date even in the Middle East, but uh, is basically what is sex to Michael Jackson? I mean, we know he's not a top, but, but <laughs> you wonder, he had a burn unit in his house. Who does that? Who sits down with the architect and says, now the burn unit will go here. Um, <laughs> and, and worse yet, what mother takes their burn child to Michael Jackson's house, you know? <laughs> Imagine, we're going to Michael Jackson's, no! And then they go and he put him in the burn unit. He looks and sees Michael coming down dressed like Joan Crawford, you know, and like <laughs> sits down next to him and goes, does it hurt? <laughs> you want some ointment? And takes out that polka dot flaccid penis and drips a watery load on your leg and says, I love you. <laughs> oh. This is filthy world, it's a beautiful place, isn't it? <laughs> Obviously, the most notorious movie I ever made was Pink Flamingos. Uh, Pink Flamingos was, thank you very much, thank you. Before we get to the question and answer period, yes, Divine really did eat dog shit in there. It was not coprophagia, though, because that would be sexual. We did it for, hopefully, for anarchy. Um, if there's anything weird remembering that time that it was no big deal to us, the day that Divine ate dog shit, I said it's in the script. She said, sure, I'll do it. And it, I'm not a sadist, it was one take. Um, but... <laughs> What I do remember being strange was, was saying to Divine, there, in the scene where he opens um, a bowel movement, gift wrapped, and I said to him, would you shit in a box tonight and bring it to the set gift wrapped tomorrow? He said, oh, sure. You know, I mean, <laughs> would I have asked Melanie Griffith to do that? I doubt it, you know. Um, I remember when the film came out for its 25th anniversary, it became the number two best-selling video in America. I thought, how could that be possible? Number one was Jerry Maguire, and... <laughs> And number three was The Rock. And I, I remember that my favorite story is it was playing here at the Angelica, and next door was Anna Karina was playing, and people that were in Anna Karina later told me that you could hear Divine next door yelling in the most beautiful love scene in Anna Karina. You could hear Divine yelling, someone has sent me a bowel movement. <laughs> <laughs> Just ruining it for everyone, you know. And... My friend who played the singing anus, you know, Papa Ooh Mao Mao, he's my age now. And, you know, he basically said when his parents died, the only good thing about it was that they never found out he had done this. <laughs> but he would go to matinees when it was just playing in a regular theater with like, you know, 10 people and sit next to somebody. And when his scene came on, Papa Ooh Mao Mao, he'd tap a stranger and go, that's me, you know. <laughs> it's great. It was like asshole terrorism in the day, you know? <laughs> and I later met the woman who now lives in the house where we filmed Pink Flamingos in the Marble House, and I said, have you ever seen the movie? And she said, I haven't. I said, you should rent it. And uh, the next time I saw her, she went, oh my God, I saw a divine licking my banister that I walked down every day. Now, Pink Flamingos was about testing limits. Um, Everybody has limits, you know. I, I, I showed this to my prison class. I taught in prison in the 80s for about six years. And my class was all murderers. And I showed them Pink Flamingos. And afterwards, they said, you are fucked up, man. <laughs> <laughs> Which was maybe the best review the movie ever got, actually. <laughs> We all have limits, you know? I have limits. Um, at first, the bear community kind of surprised me. This is, you know, middle-aged, hairy, fat homosexuals that find that erotic. You know, all gay people know about that, no straight people know about that. And, uh, you know, 
bears look for cubs, and cubs look for otters, people that aren't fat or hairy yet, or, but will be. Um, there's a lot of vocabulary, like grism is bear cum. Um, <laughs> They talk about, this is my husband bear and my significant otter. And <laughs> they talk about coming out of the second closet. That's too much for me. I said, what do you mean? You tell your parents you're a bear? They said, yes, yeah, sometimes we do. And I thought, oh, come on. Your parents have finally accepted you're gay. And then you come in and say, I have something else to tell you. Sit down. I am a bear. A what? <laughs> Don't tell your parents you're a bear. God, cruel and unusual punishment. Now, I have big trouble with the adult baby community. I don't get it, you know? I, I, I've seen their brochures, and I didn't want to know that you could buy a bouncy chair for a 350-pound man. And they have middle-aged men in diapers with hard-ons on scooters with lollipops. I'm against this, I'm sorry. <laughs> They've ruined it for everybody, you know? Now, now I see a baby on board bumper sticker. I think a grown man is masturbating in the car seat in the front. A lot of limits, you know? Um, have you heard about ultimate nudity? That's when some men take the skin of their testicles and have it removed and replaced with clear plastic on the theory it's more erotic to see how the sperm is made. <laughs> or, you know, anal bleaching. This is a new thing. I'm not so sure if this is legend or really movie stars are getting their assholes bleached to look younger. I hear this, and I guess <laughs> if you have a rimmer partner, it's a good idea. Can't hurt, really. And. And the one thing that I guess is the worst that I've heard is blossoms, if, if you all know what blossoms are. Blossoms are anal fissures for people that have been fist fucked so much that their asshole is on the outside like a cauliflower. And they trade pictures of who has the biggest blossom online. I know. I, can, I know. I can feel the revulsion going back on the rose here. <laughs> Everybody had limits. You know, Divine's father said to him once, you know, I know you make a lot of money wearing a dress. I'm fine with that. Please don't be a ballet dancer. That makes me sick. <laughs> and even Divine had limits. The first time he met Richard Simmons, he felt homophobic. <laughs> Pink Flamingos has lots of censorship problems still. I don't know why. When the Museum of Modern Art bought a print, I thought that would work with a jury. We could say, not since Manzoni's shit in a can, or Gilbert and George's naked shit pictures, or Warhol's oxidation, but it didn't work. They still found us guilty. They were not, they were not impressed by the museum having it in the collection. Um, I've had censorship problems. The best one, I guess, in London, they were honest. They said, we do not know how to deal with purposeful bad taste. Uh, and, <laughs> The worst was Canada, where we sent a print, it just never came back, and finally I had the nerve to ask, and they sent me a form that just said on it, destroyed. <laughs> they just burned the print. I thought, well, I didn't know quite how to deal with that. Um, what happens today is it in video shops, and, and it's in there just in the comedy section, and families come in and say, we loved Hairspray, let's get another John Waters movie. <laughs> and, I read the police report in Florida. They took it home, and the family said, we got halfway through it. That's the ba ba boo mow mow the singing <laughs> asshole. And, you know, I'm glad I ruined their family's night, really, because why didn't they just turn it off? No, they called the police. Why didn't they turn it off? That's what I did when Forrest Gump started running. <laughs> I mean, who am I supposed to call in the barn-raising scene in Witness? I want a number. Our community has standards, too, you know. In Tokyo, they have the best censorship. You can have a snuff movie, but just don't show pubic hair. That's the one thing you can't do. So I went to the premiere of Pink Flamingos, and I'm watching it there, and I thought, what's the matter with the print? Because this little optical ball would come down and hover over pubic hair and go away all through the movie. I thought, what is that? It's like, it's great. It's like, follow the bouncing ball. You know, it makes it dirtier and better, actually. I'm really quite for it. My favorite of my old movies is Female Trouble. Um, Female Trouble, thank you. 
Female Trouble was released uh, two years ago on a beautiful new DVD, and of course I did the director's commentary. And I always wonder, why do I always have to do the commentary? Why does the director do it? Why, can't they ask craft service? I mean, they could say like, that bitch didn't have food issues. I put salt in her food, she's not dead, is she? <laughs> or an angry editor would be good. You should have seen what I had to work with. This hack couldn't cut his way out of a paper bag, you know? It would, it would make it more interesting, I think. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, it's about someone that wants to be famous so badly they commit murder so they can get the electric chair because in their chosen profession, it's like receiving the Academy Award. When I made this movie, it seemed like a parody. Today, it seems like it could actually be true. Um, I, I'm very much interested in capital punishment and very, very, very much against it for the main reason that I'm afraid I'll get it. <laughs> we all have bad nights, you know? And, where I live, you get, they're so liberal in Maryland, you get the choice in capital punishment. You can get either the gas chamber or lethal injection. Well, who wouldn't pick the gas chamber? I mean, you can bang your head up against the glass and scream, I want to live for the press. <laughs> you know, lethal injection, you waste an outfit. They can't even see what you're wearing. And I'm interested in about last meals that you're allowed to get, too. I think Joan of Arc had communion, which seems sensible. But um, uh, my prison class said, man, I'd have a steak dinner, french fries. I said, no, I wouldn't, because when you get the electric chair, you lose control of your bowels. If, if I was on death row, I'd be especially snotty. And they'd say, what, is, what do you want for your last meal? I'd say, a single leaf of arugula. <laughs> but if you can pick your last meal, why can't you pick your last outfit? It seems like designers could compete, and I, I try to think, what would I wear if I was getting the electric chair? Well, trendy rubber flip-flops would be a good start, but <laughs> even though I'm always against fringe, you can never wear fringe, except maybe metallic fringe in the electric chair. When it flies up, it would be quite a look there at the end. And let's go even further. Why don't you get to pick your dreamy executioner? You could look through a book of Tom of Finland nude studs and pick one. <laughs> have him come in. That's a little stage. Have everybody be nude watching, jerk off. Let's make it as sick as it really is. <laughs> now, I used to go to trials all over the country before court TV made it so accessible. Um, you know, I went to all the big ones, uh, Patty Hearst, Manson, Watergate, the Hanafi Muslims, and you'd see other people would say, hi, are you going to Angela Davis? I'll see you there. And they, okay, you know. And uh, I was at the Watergate trial, which was the hardest of all to get in. There was only 10 seats for the public. You had to wait for two days, so people are name dropping different trials, and one older woman was very quiet, and then finally she said, I was at Nuremberg. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! I, I, I can't go to trials today because they recognize me and I'm afraid the jury, if they hate my movies, will take it out on the defendant and give him more time. Um, so what I try to do now is look in the paper if there's a little trial that no one cares about and somebody gets busted for something ridiculous and says the trial date is set for, it's always six months away. No one writes it down except me. And uh, <laughs> I, I went to this one case. This is kind of terrible, but I feel compelled to share it with you all tonight. Um, it was a case in Baltimore where this, it was in the Baltimore Sun, I couldn't believe it, this nurse was accused of, well, stuffing turds in her patient's mouth. And I thought, well, I better go. So, <laughs> I, I went and I was the only person in the courtroom, it was really embarrassing, and <laughs> I heard the prosecutor say, he's here, do you believe it? I was like, oh. And she got off for PMS, I'm not making this up, and this was a very long time ago, and only about three months ago, I was at a cocktail party, and this man came over and said, hi, do you remember me? And I said, no, he said, you were in my courtroom, and I thought, oh, which time when I got busted? He said, no, you were a spectator. I said, which case? And he said, well, it involved feces. And I said, Felicia, how is she? He said, I don't know how she is. He was her lawyer, and he was like really uptight that I thought he had befriended her or something. <laughs> The movie, <laughs> the movie I did that did the worst was called Desperate Living when it came out. It was a, it was a fairy tale about, thank you, about lesbian 
anguish and mental illness and politics and corruption in a town called Mortville that was made out of garbage by my longtime production designer, Vince Perenia, who did the set tonight also. Um, when this movie came out, lesbian groups stopped it from being shown in Boston at the Orson Welles Cinema, where all my movies played at the time, by saying, how dare a man make a comedy about lesbians? Well, today, it's the movie that lesbian groups bring on colleges all the time to raise money. So um, it's odd how even minorities' sense of humor can change in 20 years. Uh, this film starred uh, Liz Renee, who was the first time we used an outside star. She was a real star to me. She was in the press all the time because she was a gangster mall, and she was Mickey Cohen, the gangster's girlfriend, and she refused to testify against him, and Bobby Kennedy really hated her. So he sent her to Terminal Island Prison, where she wrote a book called My Face for the World to See, where she describes herself as perhaps the most beautiful woman of our time. <laughs> <laughs> I like perhaps, you know, modesty is important in a friend. <laughs> when she was released, uh, it was at the height of the streaking fad, and she ran completely nude when she was in her 50s up Hollywood Boulevard, five blocks, and of course was arrested. And uh, in the court, though, the jury found her lewd, crude, but socially redeeming and let her off. She wrote another great book called How to Attract Men, where she had really down-to-earth advice, like be nude and have a bar next to your bed. <laughs> She, she wrote another book called Staying Young, How to Get Free Facelifts, and basically what you do is you go volunteer to be a guinea pig from people that are learning how to do it. And, you know, she's had a lot. I mean, she has a, a, she's always surprised looking, but uh, she's, she's the happiest woman I know. I, I still visit her whenever I'm in Las Vegas, where, of course, is where she lives. And I, I said to her, well, what are you doing? And she said, I just made a new movie. And I said, what's it called? And she said, The Corpse Grinders 2. And I said, where'd you film that? And she said, in my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> this film, uh, <laughs> it was a time, you know, where we got extras. I, I wasn't a signatory with SAG at the time, and I didn't know the rules about extras, and I think we really defied them, because um, how we got extras in those days is we would lure homeless people to Edith's shopping bag, which was a thrift shop, and then take them on, like, people's temple-type buses out into the woods, and then have the bus leave so they were trapped there, and they had to do <laughs> nude scenes in November with no food or anywhere to sit. I think that's a violation, or I don't know. <laughs> but, so I feel so bad about that that today I go overboard to try to do everything right with SAG when I make movies. Um, after this, like, midnight movies were over. Video came out, and uh, it changed everything. So I, I made a movie called Polyester that was, I guess, my first above-ground movie that was made not to play at midnight. Thank you. If you haven't seen Polyester, it was shot in Odorama, which meant that when you came in the theater, you got a card with one to ten on that card, and when the, on the screen, when that number uh, appeared, you scratched and sniffed it. Um, I saw audiences in every country in the world, in every language, in every kind of government, pay me money to smell a fart. It was amazing. <laughs> You'd hear it, and they'd all... <laughs> everywhere. In the whole world, it's a universal urge to smell a fart. It was amazing to me. <laughs> Communism, capitalism, all fart smellers. <laughs> and right before the movie came out, the insurance company said, you know, you have to test these cards to make sure they're okay if someone ate one. I thought, Who's going to eat an Odorama card? It was this a, a problem they had with 3D glasses? Like, mm, yummy, I think I'll eat it. I, you know. <laughs> so if you still have an Odorama card, you can eat it. It's okay. Um, when it came out on video and DVD, they put a different version of it in because political correctness hit Odorama. They wouldn't let us do glue because they said, it's an R-rated movie. We can't have young people smelling glue today. Oh, please. <laughs> so we just put some other smell. The joke is still there. Uh, I guess the worst thing that happened is about two years ago on the Rugrats sequel, they stole my Odorama idea, and they released Odorama cards in like fast food restaurants with the exact same logo and name. And when I tried to cause trouble, I found out that New Line had forgotten to renew the patent, so they got away with it. And they basically said to me, John, you know, we thought this was an homage. I said, a check would have been homage, I think. <laughs> uh, 
Tab Hunter starred in this movie, the first time we had a real Hollywood movie star working with us. I remember Divine, only time I ever saw him nervous was the day before Tab Hunter showed up and Divine knew he had to dance with him in drag that night. Um, Tab really made this film a success, his participation in it. And he's written a book recently, a lovely book, where he's very kind about his memories of making the movie with us. And I remember at the time, some people said, you know, Tab Hunter isn't out yet and everything. I said, it doesn't matter. What he did then, making out with Divine in that movie, caused way more of a sensation than anything he could have done by saying, I'm gay. So um, I think what he did was actually much more radical and much braver than uh, just coming out at that time. So I really want to thank Tab for helping make that movie the success it was. Um, also in this movie was, of course, Edith the Egg Lady, um, Edith Massey, who was, who was a lovely, lovely woman. She did know what she was doing. People thought she didn't. I remember when the Newsweek review came out of Polyester, it said that she either deserved an Oscar or the 24-hour nurse. And I read it to her, and she said, I'd like both, actually. And, Edie and I used to do this kind of date together, and we, but we'd drive by car, and she would drive me crazy because she would say out loud every single thing she saw. We'd be driving along, she'd say, car, house, lawn, pretty lady, red car, telephone pole, lawn, lawn, lawn. I thought, Edith! No, it was, it, it was just internalization was a concept she was very unfamiliar with. And my favorite memory of Edith is she had a thrift shop, Edith's shopping bag, and she only sold what people gave her. She never bought anything. So in the summer, it would be dead months, and she'd be sitting there in Baltimore, August, really hot. And so she would just go through the garbage and gift wrap um, aspirin bottle tops and everything, and then have a grab bag, 25 cents. But it was all <laughs> garbage that she was going to throw out. So the little kids from the projects would run down and say, Miss Edie, what's in there? And then they'd buy one, they'd open it, they'd say, what the hell is this? And she'd say, can't be lucky every day. <laughs> also in this movie was Steve Bader, the first time I had ever worked with a punk rock star. He was Steve Bader's then and then became Steve Bader. Uh, he was great, he was really a nice guy to work with. Unfortunately, he died in Paris when he was hit by a car just in the street, and he was so used to jumping off the stage every night that it was no big deal to him, and he had a concussion, and they always tell you not to go to sleep when you had a concussion, and he did, and he never woke up. And after his funeral, he was cremated, and his uh, girlfriend said to me, don't worry, I snorted his ashes. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Limits, you know. <laughs> That's hard to do. Have you ever seen ashes? It's not like sand. I mean, there's like knuckles and shit in there, you know? <laughs> uh, after that, I accidentally made a family movie called Hairspray. Um, I, I remember the day I got a PG-13, no, just a regular PG rating, and I thought, I will never work again. Uh, <laughs> It was an amazing happiness this film has brought me. And I remember uh, when it won Best Musical and I was on the stage getting the Tony, I thought, finally, I can start wearing ascots. <laughs> uh, my, my parents were there opening night. They were so happy. You know, Harvey Firestein's mom came over and said to my mom, didn't we raise terrific sons? And my mom was like, because <laughs> they didn't know each other. That's a lot of backstory in that comment. <laughs> And afterwards, my parents said, we really loved it. And it was the first time their nose didn't grow, kind of, you know? <laughs> and uh, I think that the play brought me the great joy I should have had from the movie. But, but Divine died, really, um, the week after the movie opened, which was certainly better than dying a week before it. He got to read all his nice reviews and everything. But, uh, you know, dead, he'd be very proud of this. Alive, he'd want the part. Um, I, I think even though John Travolta's gonna play the part now in the movie they're making of the Broadway play, Divine still would want the part if he was alive. Um, I, you know, I wanna get all my old ones out there working. You know, I want, someone has optioned Pink Flamingos to be an opera, and uh, I want a children's cartoon of female trouble, polyester on ice, I want them all out there. <laughs> I can't say anything good about Divine's death. You know, I still go to his grave, and fans go there all the time. You know, they, they leave donuts, they leave dresses, they leave eye makeup. One wrote on his grave in lipstick, Satan, and my friend Pat Moran said they just spelled it wrong. They meant satin. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, Ricky Lake, of course, was in this movie and went on to great success, and, and I hope she comes back to acting, because I think she's a really, really good actress, too. Uh, Marissa went on, won the Tony for this, and now they're looking for the movie in A New Unknown, which I think is great. We have, like, Tracy PLO camps right now. We have so many Tracys we have to find. We go to schools. We find fat girls. We take them away. We teach them to dance. We feed them. We put them as understudies. We've got road shows, movies. We're looking for Tracys everywhere these days. <laughs> now... Also in this movie was Sonny Bono, who was somebody I like very, very much. Uh, I think he was, who do you get if you don't get Sonny Bono? And there is no short list. You either get Sonny Bono, there's no runner-up. <laughs> and he was, of course, died in that horrible skiing accident. Uh, but at the time, people said to me, how can you use Sonny Bono? He's a Republican and he's against gay marriage. And I said, you know, I'm gaily incorrect. You know, I, I'm from a generation of gay men that the privilege of being gay was that we didn't have to get married or go in the army. <laughs> And I know we have to fight for it now, and I, I guess I'm for gay marriage. As long as that's illegal, heterosexual divorce should be illegal, believe me, and then they'd change things. Um, I'm for an all-volunteer lesbian army. Um, I, I would, I'd feel so secure at home in front of the fire knowing my sisters were kicking ass out there. They could find bin Laden. And it's confusing. I mean, today, gay people have more children than Catholics. And, and so, you know, I like kids. I, I don't want one. I mean, that, that, I would be a good uncle and get you an abortion, get you out of jail, but I'd be a terrible father, you know? So it's inspired my new hobby, which is saying inappropriate things to children. Um, I don't mean sexual. I mean, it, it all started, it was in Provincetown. It was the 4th of July parade, and I'm watching it, and my bike fell over, and uh, there was a little kid standing there, and I went out and picked up my bike, and I said to him, did you knock my bike over? He went, no. And I said, want to knock over other people's bikes together? They won't know it's us. And he went, we just moved away. <laughs> so I got hooked from doing that, you know? So. Later, this little girl was at a party. She had a little pocketbook, and I said, that's a nice new pocketbook. Is it new? And she said, yes. And I said, did you bring it here to steal things with? And she said, no! <laughs> yeah. So it's really fun. I do it in airports a lot, but you have to be careful. You have to like say it and then move away, and the parents are, I didn't say anything. What is it? Making that up, you know? So I, I got so into it, I got my own child. I got a fake child called Bill because I read about these women that make these things called reborn babies and they take baby dolls and they take them apart and they paint in veins and they put human hair and it takes longer than nine months to have one that you ordered. And I ordered an angry baby with bad hair. And uh, <laughs> he's the scariest thing in my house, I promise you. It has moisture on its lips, it's really creepy. And. Uh, I talked about him so much on the Terry Gross show that I started getting fan mail to Bill at my house, which means I had to punish him because you, you don't get that kind of success without working for it. And, <laughs> and Bill was my Christmas card last year, and uh, it said at the back, Bill is not allowed to receive gifts. And uh, I have one convict friend that got out after 23 years, and he said, I'm giving Bill a gift. You're going to stop me? And it's a little gift rack plastic turd. It's real nice. Bill's still clutching it, actually. Um, <laughs> You know, Bill has learned never to cry. He could be crying tonight in my house, but he knows that no one will ever come. Ever. <laughs> now, my only real Hollywood movie was something called Crybaby, which was uh, basically a juvenile delinquent. <laughs> <laughs> Juvenile Delinquent Musical. Uh, Crybaby is coming out on Broadway next year, too. I've heard the music. I've read the book. It's, I think it's going to be great. Who knows? Um, you know, I, when they came out, a new director's cut came out of it this year, and uh, they found all the people that were in the movie and also interviewed them, and I hadn't seen a lot of them since the day we made it. It was like watching my funeral, people eulogizing me. But, uh, but they found hatchet face Kim McGuire, who looks completely different. She's a lawyer in Mississippi now. So I felt so great. I called her, and then she told me she was a Katrina victim. She was sucked out of her house by the water and now lives in temporary housing. So hatchet face is back in the news. You know, It's a very weird feeling knowing that that happened to her. Um, this movie, of course, starred Johnny Depp, and at the time, he was uh, a teen idol on this television show, 21 Jump Street. And he said to me, I hate being a teen idol. And I said, well, stick with us. We'll kill that, you know. 
but we did in a good way, I think. Uh, Tim Burton came in and saw Dailies and put him in Edward Scissorhands, and he's gone on, I think, to have one of the most best careers of any American actor today. And he's still in touch, too. He's a, he's a really good guy. Um, also in this movie was Tracy Lords, God knows, my kind of gal. Uh, <laughs> Tracy wrote a book, too, called Underneath It All, which she's very kind to us about the making of that film. And she was still escaping porn when she came to us. And the feds would raid the set on Crybaby and try to bust her to make her come back to testify against the mob. And she would be sobbing, and Patty Hearst would be comforting her. And we all said, we've all been arrested. It's OK here. <laughs> and so it was like rehab for her, you know? And I used to travel with, with her promoting the film, and it would be scary. We'd be on airplanes, and the pilot would come out, hello, Miss Lords. Don't be thinking about her. Fly the plane. <laughs> Cops really love her. I tell you, it, you know, she was a sexual terrorist at the time. That's what she was. And, it, and it's funny to see how straight men act when they see her. They're really, really very frightened of her. Uh, she married my best friend's son in a, in a very traditional Episcopal wedding. And I remember the priest said to her, have you been baptized? And she said, yes. I thought, liar, you're Jewish. So um, <laughs> I thought, well, I better baptize her because, um, you know, Johnny Depp's lawyers had had me ordained as a priest so I could marry Winona and Johnny. But at the time, I talked him out of it. But I thought, well, while I have the power. And I did have a stolen tabernacle in my basement from a church. So I... I <laughs> I wrote a special baptism for Tracy Lords, and I had her over, and I really got into it. I had black tulips all over the house, and I played this album of castrated altar boys going, yeah, like that. And I wrote a baptism for her that wiped out men's piggish behavior and her sexual defiance, and she started crying. She was really uptight. But it worked. It was a big load of original sin, I promise you, and it's gone forever. Uh, Patricia Hearst was in my film. God knows, you're really a very valued member of my repertory group. Uh, uh, Patty Hearst was innocent. You know, what she said was always the truth, and nobody believed her till the very last SLA trial when she went on Larry King and said, I'm not afraid of the SLA. I, I, if you make me testify, I'm going to tell what happened. And they all pled guilty the next day. Um, I think that the state of California actually owes her an apology. Um, I'll tell you, no one's ever going to tell Patricia Hearst what to do again unless it's a film director that chooses his words with care. Uh, I think we need to bring back juvenile delinquency. You know, we just have wilding now. It's not exactly the same. Um, I try to tell kids how to be juvenile delinquents, but it's hard. Race used to work, but now all white kids want to be black. So that doesn't work. But black kids can listen to middle-of-the-road country. That'll get your parents nervous. <laughs> and if, if you're a white kid, start talking about wanting to go to Albania to study folk dancing. That will really make them uptight. We have to make it cool to be poor again. You know, uh, when I was young, we wanted to kill the rich. You wanted to be rich at 40, not 20. So I try to tell kids about welfare fraud. It's really fun to do, you know? Uh, we always used to do that. You, it's easy now, I bet. You go to a city, we don't have any money, we're starving, we have diseases. And then they give you, they give you emergency food vouchers, and then you go buy crab meat and have a dinner party and watch people have a nervous breakdown on the checkout line when they see you paying with emergency food vouchers. Ha ha ha, get the parsley! <laughs> You know, it, it, it perks it up, really. And, and, and also, like, sexual preference. What's the big deal anymore? Gay is not enough. Um, it, it's a good start, certainly, you know. But, um, but I think we have to go further. You know, I do this act at colleges a lot, and I think, what, everyone's gay? But they're only gay in rich kids' schools, not poor kids' schools. So I realize a lot of people, mostly women, are transsexual. You know, but I don't get how they eat pussy for politics. It's still hard to fake when you have to deep throat and talk about politics. Politics. I tell them, you have to come in. And they get really uptight. Come in? What do you mean? I'm out. No, you should go back in. We don't want you, you know? <laughs> now, I'm not saying that I haven't been a victim of homophobia. I was in a bank teller line the other day, and this woman butt right in front of me. And I said, I guess you're going to butt. And she said, I guess you're a fag. And I said, I guess you're overdrawn. And she was. <laughs> <laughs> I. What gay people have to use is humor as terrorism, the way the yippies used to do. If you have a local politician that's voting against gay marriage, send the skankiest drag queens to his house and have him yell fashion insults to his wife. <laughs> It'll work. <laughs> or get some meth gay guys and have them hide in the woods and scare a Boy Scout troop. They deserve it. <laughs> now, after Crybaby, well, came Serial Mom, which... Hmm. 
It's a movie that is about how much fun it would be to kill people if you could get away with it. Everybody has things that get on their nerves every day that you'd like to punish. I have two. One, people in airports that do their exercises at the gate. I hate these people. We're waiting for a plane, not a trainer, asshole. We know you're healthy. Sit down and shut up. Another thing I hate, people that say picture instead of picture. People say, can I take your picture? No, you can't. Mine is home in the kitchen. I use it to pour milk out of. And people say, John, that's really being awfully elitist. That's a, a local thing. It's not a local thing. It's a stupid thing. Don't say it. <laughs> Kathleen Turner was in this movie. She's great to work with. Believe me, meeting Kathleen Turner is like going to prison. Show no fear and you'll do great. Uh, <laughs> She was great in Virginia Woolf on Broadway. I think it was one of an amazing performance. And, and I, I think she's really lovely in the film. I remember the first day of rehearsal. I always have rehearsal in my living room in my house. And Mink Stoll and her were running the lines. And I heard Mink Stoll call Kathleen Turner a cocksucker. And I thought, finally, my worlds have come together. <laughs> And only last year I met Boy George, and I didn't know Boy George, and he said, well, call me on the cell phone. And I did, and he didn't answer, but his answering machine says, cocksucker residence, when you pick up. <laughs> Which really surprised me. Um, <laughs> After this movie came Pecker, and, and Pecker is my really movie about, my feel-good movie about contemporary art, pubic hair harassment, and talking virgin mothers. Uh, <laughs> My, my favorite review we got was in the Japan Times. It said it was a Disney film for perverts. <laughs> uh, I like contemporary art very much. I collect it, and I have my own art shows. And, and I tell all the people in the art world how lucky they are, because in the film world, we have to pretend that every person's going to love our movie. Where in the art world, if every person loves it, it's terrible. And, you know, suppose artists had to test their work like we have to test our movies. Suppose they had a testing for collectors, like eight collectors, and they'd show them the work like Nan Goldens, and a collector would say, can't they just do marijuana and not heroin? <laughs> or, like, show them a Gursky photo. It's too big. It won't fit over my sofa. <laughs> now, I... I tried to address an issue in Pecker that's very important, is, is that why don't young people vote anymore? In the last election, really, they didn't. And I think I've figured out why, is that they're so badly decorated voting places. Can't they fix them up a little better? <laughs> Those voting machines look like bad peep shows, and it's, you just walk in, it's so dreary, and people dress so frumpishly when they vote. You don't have to do that. When you vote next time, wear something skin tight, something low cut, you know? When you're waiting in line, cruise people. <laughs> and when you go in that booth and you pull the lever, touch yourself. <laughs> It really makes it more un-American and more fun. Now, the only thing better than making a movie, I think, is to think up a new sex act, which I tried to do in Pecker. Um, I had teabagging. Um, teabagging is when you hit your partner in the forehead with your testicles. Um, it's, it's a fleeting moment. It's, you know, it's a, you can't get pregnant, it's safe. Um, all women have been accidentally teabagged when if their husband climbs over them in the morning to get out of bed and go to work, basically. <laughs> Uh, where we filmed this it was a real bar where the, once the movie came out, they had teabagging contests every night, and they had different steps, the Lipton, the flow through. And, <laughs> and I would go there, but it was torture because they would all come over and try to teabag me, so I'd be leaving like with like <laughs> bruises all over my forehead. But I was saved because they changed the law at this place and they made it so that you could now dance naked with hard-ons. And so now it's called helicoptering. They go whap, 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 whap. So it was no more teabagging, all helicoptering at all the time. <laughs> now, after this came Cecil B. Demented. This is a movie about film terrorism. I mean, if you can imagine getting this made after 9-11, it would be completely impossible. But um, I got the idea because I read in Film Threat magazine, they had a joke about that their readers should attack the readers of Premiere. And actually, some of them did that, which, uh, and then they had to run a retraction. But wouldn't that be exciting if, if uh, some cities were cinematically tense? I mean, suppose the Angelica's audience attacked the Zigfield one night, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would, really would perk up film-going habits in the city, I think. Um, 
you know, I, in there, all the people have, uh, in the cult of Cecil B. DeMena, get their tattooed of their favorite director on their arms. And I think everyone should do that. Wouldn't that make dating easier? <laughs> if you just, on your first date, looked at the tattoo? I would get Joseph Losey if it was me. Um, I, I've noticed recently that people have been getting my name tattooed, and it makes me uptight. You know, I go to a city, and I sign their body part, and, and then the next time I come back to the city, they show me they've had it tattooed on. And Eve Severe, I think, was the first one. But the last Last time I did this girl's ass big, and I didn't know she was going to get it tattooed. And she came back, and her whole ass says John Waters, and she had just had it done. It was scabbing and stuff, you know. And I thought, <laughs> and she was with her boyfriend. I said, "What does he think?" And she says, "Every time he looks at my ass, he thinks of you." <laughs> I. I've had scary fans, but I kind of like them. At one signing, I saw this girl coming, and I knew there was trouble, and she said, will you sign anything? And I said, sure, and she whipped her Tampax out, splat, down on the desk. <laughs> I signed it, she bought the book. You know, I held the pen up high, it was my first unsafe autograph, and uh, the funniest thing was that, for some reason, the bookstore had given me this giant African-American bodyguard, and he started crying. <laughs> so uptight when she did this. And I kept saying, she meant well, it's all right, it's all right. Uh, another girl one night said, would you sign my colostomy bag? I said, yeah, well, yeah, with a felt tip, no Sharpies, you know? Uh, Stephen Dorff played Cecil B. DeMent. I think he did a great job. For, and then last year he was dating Pamela Anderson. Does life get any better, you know, when you read these things? Uh, Melanie Griffith was in it, and I, I think she gave me a really good performance. She was in on the joke. Believe me, it's really hard to play a bad actress and do a good job of it, and I think she did. She was in Beauty Schizophrenia when we made that movie because she was also the Revlon Woman of the Year, and in the middle of our movie, she had to be a conventional, like, age, defiant. Then she'd come back and Van Smith, who's our ugly expert and has thought up the Vines look and everybody in all my movies would wreck her so she'd look like a John Waters heroine. So it was very confusing for Melanie to go back and forth in these two very, very different worlds. My last movie was A Dirty Shame. Uh, Dirty Shame is about sex addicts, people that uh, have, thank you, <laughs> about a tiny minority of people with head injuries that after their concussion experience a carnal lust they cannot control. Um, I just read this one sentence in a book and turned it into an entire movie. Uh, we filmed in a very blue-collar, middle-class Baltimore neighborhood, and I thought, we're never going to get away with this because we put fake anuses on their trees, we had giant penis branches, but all the families came out and posed for pictures with them, with their kids and everything. <laughs> I was amazed. And even the head of the community association said to me, thank you for what you did for this neighborhood. I thought, well, what did I do? Did, like, sex addicts move here now? I, I, it's just amazing to me. Um, I had a big hassle with the Motion Picture Association of America. My, I feel like my career came full circle. I was as shocked that I got an NC-17 for this movie as I was the day I got a PG rating for Hairspray. I really didn't expect it, and, and my contract said it had to be an R-rated movie. So you have this conversation with the MPAA, and, and I said, well, what can I cut? You know, and they said, we stopped taking notes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> God. And it was a nightmare. You know, I went and appealed it, and this other woman said, don't spill the cookie crumbs. I thought, oh. But you know, the most frustrating thing is that they were nice. And, and it's, I'm not used to dealing with liberal censors. I'm used to dealing with stupid censors. And these are kind of smart liberal censors, which are much scarier, believe me. And, uh, and they said, well, there's nothing wrong with an NC-17 movie, a movie only for adults. And I said, that's true, technically. And I, but you have to go out there with your lobbyists and enforce the rule. So Walmart will carry it, Blockbuster will carry it, but they don't. They don't back you up on this brand that they want you to go sell. And, uh, and that makes a big, big difference. I mean, even in the landmark chain, like a great art distributing chain, some of the landlords of the local theaters won't let them play an NC-17 movie. So I thought it couldn't hurt me, but it did. And they control the advertising, too. Selma Blair in this movie has these giant fake tits, and she could have fake tits that big on the East and West Coast. They had to be smaller in Mid-America and even smaller in Utah, and I'm not making this up. <laughs> so, uh, and then the Catholic Church attacked me. I thought, they still do that? You know, I was amazed, you know? <laughs> and I, I wanted the condemned rating, but they don't have that anymore. It's called O for offensive. Well, duh, you know. <laughs> but, this guy, William O'Donohue or something, he's the head of the Catholic League, he attacked me personally in this editorial and said, who is this John Waters? He's a homosexual and the woods are full of them these days. 
I don't think the Catholic Church's woods are too safe to walk in from what I've been reading. I think my father had the best review. After he came to the premiere, I thought, does my 89-year-old father really have to know what a plate job is? You know, but uh, afterwards he said, it was pretty funny, but I hope I never see it again. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother had a good line before we made the movie. She said, oh, what's this one about? And I said, sex addicts. And she said, oh, maybe we'll die first. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I still live in Baltimore because it still really inspires me. Um, it's a city where everybody thinks they're normal, but they're totally insane. And I also live here, and everybody here thinks they're insane, but maybe they're normal, you know? It's, it's different. Um, I have cinematic immunity in Baltimore in a weird way, but people still yell to me, hey, Barry, Barry! We, they think I'm Barry Levinson, we all look alike, you know? Uh, but I'm inspired there. The first day of spring last week, I saw about a 50-year-old woman with a big gut, and she had on a Britney Spears halter top with, she had just had her navel pierced, but it was infected and pus, and she was still <laughs> walking out like this. I thought, look at her, you know, unbelievable. And Travel and Leisure magazine recently picked Baltimore as having the ugliest people. And I, I was proud. I told the mayor, let's put it on the benches, on the t-shirts. And he was mad about it. But I thought, well, it's better than being second ugliest. That was Philadelphia. <laughs> we, we have great bars there. There's one I always take my New York friends in because they can't believe their eyes. It's in a trailer park. And to go there, you go over the speed bumps and you get in. And it's a lot of really mean fat girls, and, and they just fight each other, but they don't throw them out. Then they just sit there and bleed and smoke. Bleed and smoke. And their boyfriends all look like Eminem, and they play gangster rap, but they're hardcore racists, which I really don't get, you know? They use the N-word, and if a black person comes in, they change the music to dang me, to hell if they can rope and hang me. It's a really a hideous place, but you gotta see it once. Uh, there's also a jazz bar I go to sometime in a neighborhood called Pigtown, which is not a bad thing to say about this neighborhood. It's what they call it. But uh, the jazz combo when I was there had all nodded out on heroin, but everybody else was just going, hey, all right, all right. But they were completely <laughs> nodded out. There was no instruments or anything. <laughs> I, I also really like to eavesdrop. I hear the best lines in Baltimore. My favorite one, and this is a true story, this family was walking up the street and the little kid said, Dad, why is mommy crying? And Dad said, because you're an asshole. <laughs> I, think, I think that's gonna be the first line in my new movie. Uh, it's testing well. <laughs> uh, I also was in a supermarket, and I saw this angelic little child walk away from her mother, and her mother said, get over here, shit ass. <laughs> and even, even in a fancy restaurant, I was in the prime rib, and I heard the waiter said, madam, uh, would you like dessert? And she said, Christ, no, I'm bloated. <laughs> It, it never ends. In a bar recently, a guy said to me, you know, everybody thinks I'm a 30-year-old junkie, but actually, I'm a 40-year-old alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> now, I hear good things in New York, too, and Joe Jr. is a restaurant I like near where I live. I heard two women having lunch, and one said, she's needy, she's nasty, she's a bitch, but that's who she is. <laughs> and... At an art opening, I heard a woman say, look at her outfit, it's so September 10th. <laughs> now, I have to go to L.A. once in a while, too, to get money and stuff, you know, and it's, it's, it's always weird when I go there, people say, would you like to get a massage? No, the idea of a stranger touching me in a non-sexual way is horrible, I think, you know? 
but I, I do go to the Vanity Fair party. It is a great party because everyone's so famous. It's like a joke. And, uh, but my, I don't name drop in these things. I'm, this is my only name dropping. That uh, My friend went over to Farrah Fawcett two years ago at the Vanity Fair party and said, would you like to meet John Waters? And she said, no, I would not. <laughs> <laughs> so I really felt happy coming home on the plane, you know. Uh, there's a lot of movies I'd like to make, but I, I know they won't let me. You know, I, I'd love to make a nudist camp movie. I, I grew up with happy, healthy idiots on pogo sticks with airbrushed crotches. That was sexy to me. But I know I couldn't get that made. And, and I don't really want to do a porn movie, because after I watch them too much, it looks like open heart surgery to me, kind of. And, and even the titles aren't any good that much anymore. I mean, Schindler's Fist was a good one. <laughs> but. I went to the porn convention recently, and I saw a booth of porn that I didn't know about. First of all, it was really embarrassing. I walk in the porn convention, and go, John, John! I go, oh, yeah, hi. <laughs> and uh, I go over this booth, and it's all real surveillance tapes, and I didn't know that Night Watchmen fuck boxes. Did you know this? I didn't know this. But it's all shots of like a night watchman sitting in a warehouse looking over, and then he goes over and starts fucking the cargo. <laughs> this obviously happens all the time. So. Next day delivery UPS, I'd wear gloves when I've opened it because someone just fucked your 24-hour delivery. I, and I said, well, how do you get their permission? He said, they sign releases. They do? <laughs> Amazing to me. Now, my hobby is extreme Catholic behavior before the Reformation. Um, that's how I relax, really, reading about this kind of thing. There's a great book called Holy Anorexia, The Eating Disorders of the Saints. Uh, it's still in print, University of Chicago Press. And my favorite in it is, is really St. Catherine of Siena. She, she's who I pray to. She was the worst of all. She was against the Reformation. She sold indulgences. She hung out with the bad popes. And her specialty was to go into a hospital and to cancer wards and rip off scabs of patients and eat it and offer it up to God. I thought, what did they say to her? Ma'am, you can't do that in here, really. You know, uh, I, I think Jane Fonda would really be good in this part, actually. It would be a really... Um, I'm also interested in Mariolatry. That's the undue worship of Mary, people that worship Mary more than Jesus. And I'd like to do a movie called Manger Mania, uh, where <laughs> the, Mary gives the virgin birth and she eats the Christ child and then goes on a binge of miracles punishing every person that worshiped Jesus more than her. <laughs> um, maybe I should make a children's film. Um, you know, I, I like children's films, but I have problems when I go. I, I go to a matinee in Baltimore, and I walk up and I say, one, please. And the woman says, this is a children's film, you know. And I say, I know, I know. I go in the theater, thumbelina, you know. I sit down, and I see parents, mothers looking at me. And, I know I look like a child molester. I know. I'm, I mean, I'm not, but it looks like central casting sent me, basically. So the mother starts saying, move over here. Move, sit over here with mommy. So by the time the whole movie theater's packed, except for all empty seats, an island around me. So I don't go anymore. It's too embarrassing. And it's, it's just not the same at home watching Benji Unleashed by yourself on DVD. It just doesn't have that same feel. Um, I've been an actor in some things. I started out in uh, Jonathan Den Demi's Something Wild, where I played a used car salesman. I guess I was right off uh, typecast. I was, here's one I bet you didn't know I was in, Danielle Steele's Family Album, where I play a porn director, a <laughs> big stretch. Uh, I have two out of the three uh, checkout women in the supermarket in Baltimore that wear unironic Farrah Fawcett hairdos. They always say to me, I seen you on Danielle Steele's Family Album. <laughs> And that is the only thing they know that I've done, really, because it's on late night television so much. Um, I was in Woody Allen's movie, Sweet and Lowdown. I, was, I played a pedophile priest in Blood Feast 2. I was in the last Chucky movie, which was really fun. Uh, Chucky and his son got to kill me. Um, I have a television show that's out right now called uh, John Waters Presents Movies That Will Corrupt You on the Here Network. Uh, it's cable on demand, $3.99, cheaper than a bottle of poppers. And, uh, <laughs> In this, I get to show movies like Irreversible and Porn Theater and Who Killed Pasolini, movies that really 30 years ago I'd be in prison for showing, 10 years ago I'd be in a mental institution for imagining I could show them on TV, and this year I had a big launch for it at Sundance. It's, it's still amazing to me. 
Also, I have a new part in a court TV series uh, called Till Death Do Us Part, and I play the groom raper. <laughs> reaper! I kept thinking they said the groom raper, but it's the groom reaper. And it's about a spou every week a bride or a groom that kill each other, and it's based on true crime. And I'm a guest at the wedding every week who looks at the camera and knows they're going to kill each other. So um, I, I, we're looking for, there hasn't been a gay marriage yet where anybody's killed one another, but if you're planning, let us know so we can put it on the show. We're actually, we're really looking for one. Um, I think the real reason I'm doing this is because one day I, I want the lead in the Don Knotts story. That's the only reason, really. And, you know, and as we all know, Don recently died, and I was so distraught I almost canceled tonight, but I, I pulled my way through. Um, you know, sometimes I pretend I'm Don Knotts all day long, and my staff has to call me that. It's a learned thing that they're used to. I know Steve Buscemi and I will fight each other for the part, certainly. <laughs> But the real reason I'm doing it is because if the movie ever comes out on every bus in New York and Baltimore will be big signs that say, John Waters is Don Knotts. Thank you very much. Thank you.